So just to introduce myself, I'm Kate LeMay, I'm the Acting Senior Historian at the National Portrait Gallery, um, the Interim Director of Portal, the National Portrait Gallery's Scholarly Center. This is my dog. I don't know if you can see her. Um, thank you again for joining us. Uh, tonight's program is entitled Jose Maria Mora, Napoleon Cerrone and the Migrant Surround in American Portrait Photography. And it will be presented by Dr. Aaron Powells, who is Assistant Professor of Art History at the Tyler School of Art and Architecture at Temple University. Leslie Urenia, my colleague, curator of photographs at the National Portrait Gallery is going to moderate the Q&A. Before we begin, we'd like to uh, give a land acknowledgement. Although we are tuning in to together today from different places, we gratefully acknowledge the Native people on whose ancestral homelands we gather, as well as the diverse and vibrant Native communities who make their home in these places today. We also recognize the inherent flaws of portraiture. Since this nation's founding, who is represented and how one is represented reflects the country's flaws as well as its strengths. The National Portrait Gallery strives to present a more complete narrative, one that acknowledges the history of slavery, racism, and inequality in the United States. We are so pleased to present today's event as part of the Greenberg Steinhauser Forum in American Portraiture. The National Portrait Gallery acknowledges the recent passing of Daniel B. Greenberg, his generosity and that of his wife, Susan, make the Greenberg Steinhauser Forum in American Portraiture possible. Um, a little bit of, you know, just ground guidelines for this Zoom format. You, like I invited you already, please use the chat function. Let us know from where you're watching, where you're Zooming in from. Um, it's exciting to see where everyone's, you know, spending their time. Um, if you would like to make comments and connections uh, to the lecture with your own ideas as you listen, you're very welcome to do that as well. When it comes for the Q&A, um, there is a Q&A feature. So you should submit your questions that will be posed by Dr. Urenia um, into that Q&A chat box, Q&A box, not the chat. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm getting all confused here, but use the Q&A feature to submit your questions. Okay, so I'm now going to introduce our guest. Aaron Powells is a scholar of American art and visual culture with special expertise in the history of photography. Her current research explores the intersections of portraiture and public identity within immigrant and indigenous communities in the late 19th and early 20th century United States. Her book on American photographer Napoleon Cerrone and the problems of asserting artistic authorship at the dawn of mass media is forthcoming, yay, Erin, uh, with Penn State University Press. Erin has a BA in art history from Carleton College, holds an MA in humanities and social thought from New York University. And she earned a dual PhD in art history and American studies from Indiana University in Bloomington. Leslie Urania is curator of photographs at the National Portrait Gallery. And her research focuses on migration and transnational art practices. Urania's recent exhibitions include In Mid-Sentence from 2019, One Life, Marian Anderson, also 2019, and Block by Block, Naming Washington from 2021. She's co-curator of the upcoming exhibition entitled Kinship, which opens in October of this year, and also the Outwin 2022 American Portraiture Today with Tyena Caragol, which will open in April. Her writing has appeared in artforum.com, CAA Reviews, and Art It, and other volumes. Um, Urania holds a BA from Yale, a PhD from Northwestern, and both in art history. All right, so let's turn to the presentation itself. Um, without further ado, please welcome Erin.
Thank you so much, Kate. Um, and thanks also to Jackie and Leslie and to Portal for um, inviting me to participate in the Greenberg Steinhauser Forum on American Portraiture. Um, it's an honor to be with you and to have this chance to share my recent work on an area of American portraiture that deserves greater attention. I'm speaking to you today from Philadelphia, which is part of the indigenous territory called Lenape Hoking, the traditional homelands of the Lenny Lenape people. Remembering this deep connection to place is, uh, feels especially important right now as we connect with one another across the virtual landscape of Zoom. And in this case, our mediated social environment and the things positioned within it can perhaps provide us with some empathetic connection to the topic of my talk this evening, which helps unpack the um, historical origins of contemporary phenomena such as Zoom backgrounds by deconstructing the consciously composed spaces of Gilded Age portrait photographs. My investigation focuses on two photographers, Jose Maria Mora and Napoleon Cerrone, and we'll look specifically at tableau portraits each artist created in honor of the Centennial International Exhibition, which took place in Philadelphia in 1876. First though, allow me to offer a little background on each of these artists. Though their names may be unfamiliar, Mora and Cerrone were among the best known and most highly respected American portrait photograph photographers of the Gilded Age. Both were active in New York City from the 1870s through the 1890s and best known for creating portraits of performers that merged the tropes of grand manor painting with the stage effects of period theater. And, and in the process, they nurtured the births of both Broadway glamour and celebrity culture in the United States. Napoleon Cerrone, a native French speaker born in Quebec, was known particularly for orchestrating expressive portraits that used props and unconventional bodily pose to capture the dynamism and personality of public figures. He embraced a similar level of bravado in his own self-portrait images, thrusting himself into the public spotlight as the unmistakable individual behind a larger than life portrait brand and disguising his humble family origins and childhood poverty beneath a veneer of bohemian eccentricity. Jose Maria Mora, who was born to a wealthy family in Cuba, began his photographic career working with Cerrone in the, during the early 1870s. After launching an independent studio, he became a friendly rival to his former mentor and developed his own reputation as the undisputed master of the painted backdrop. Where typical photographic studios of the period might have two or three of these large scale canvases in rotation, Mora's studio stocked more than 150 and the photographer possessed a unique ability to make subjects appear to believably inhabit their, in, their painted environments, whether they were pictured seated in a cottage window, strolling down a city street, or transported to a more fantastical destination like the surface of the moon. So though Mora and Cerrone were both renowned artists in their own time, their work has rarely since received serious critical attention. And this is in part because the stagey effects and theatrical artifice they regularly deployed in their photography flies in the face of later ideals of modernist media purity. But it is also that the material artifacts like costumes, backdrops, and props that crowd their compositions have disguised the weightier cultural significance of their work. Historian Robert Taft, for instance, described Mora and Cerrone's portraits as grotesque manifestations of Gilded Age taste that he likened to period fashions for bustles, hoop skirts, and exaggerated side whiskers. Taft concluded that by photographing in what he described as an elaborate style, Mora and Cerrone achieved little more than simply, quote, reflecting the day in which they lived by documenting the material abundance of, of the economic boom years that followed the Civil War. Though Taft deployed the term elaborate style derisively, I have found this alignment of Gilded Age photography and consumer goods to be useful in developing a methodology for looking more patiently and seeking deeper meaning from this underappreciated moment in American photographic history. In reality, while Cerrone and Mora's photos both feature consumer objects and themselves circulated as collectible cabinet cards, they do not operate as reliable documents or follow conventional rules of material exchange. Their compositions indiscriminately mix authentic functional objects like furniture or paintings with fictive props and pretentious behaviors that make sense only in the world of the photograph. 
So using this perspective, I argue that Gilded Age portrait photos dramatize the act of visual discernment to operate not only as sites for display, but also as symbolic points of transfer between material and cultural capital, ones that disrupted standard terms of ownership through their own mass circulation and reproduction. Attending to the, what surrounds the human subjects in Gilded Age photos also helps demonstrate that Mora and Cerrone's artistic practices were motivated by something larger than profiteering, if only because their labor intensive production went, goes so far beyond the basic necessity of commercial purpose. For example, Mora's portrait of Maud Branscombe as Ophelia seems to delight in the dematerialization of form her likeness appears suspended within a multimedia atmosphere that evokes Sir John Everett Millay's famous pre-Raphaelite painting of this tragic heroine of Shakespeare's Hamlet. And it is worth emphasizing in our current age of Photoshop that to produce such an image using the photographic technologies of the 1880s was a massive creative undertaking. Long exposure times and the short focal length of period portrait cameras would have made posing such a scene outdoors absolutely impracticable. So instead, Mora painstakingly constructed this illusory setting for his image using composite printing, retouching, and a generous measure of darkroom magic. In my published work on this subject, I draw upon TJ Damos and James Elkins in referring to this type of ephemeral photographic space as a migrant surround. I use this term to describe both the sense of visual dislocation the photograph evokes and the fluid possibilities for identity performance that come from freedom from real world realities. This renegotiation of photography's expressive possibilities is especially significant coming as it did during peak years of the peak decades of global migration to the United States in the late 19th century. And in this sense, it is significant that Mora and Cerrone both were recent arrivals to the US who arrived to their careers in photography as strategies for personal and professional reinvention. For Mora, who had been exiled from his family home in Cuba, and for Cerrone, who was orphaned shortly after arriving in New York City, along with many of their sitters um, who, were, who left one place to begin anew in the United States, including Maud Branscombe here. Um, the imaginative territory of portrait photography represented an opportunity to fashion a coherent sense of self from the multifaceted allegiances and cultural fluencies that framed experiences of immigration. Under these circumstances, the visual language of fantasy and material dislocation that characterized a so-called elaborate style of photography may have seemed especially well-suited to representing the, the realities of this lived experience. So viewed together then, I propose that the ambiguous objects and spaces in Gilded Age portrait photos can lend new dimension to the histories we derive from these visual artifacts. Um, and in the remainder of my time today, I will focus on two series of staged portrait tableaus that emerged from Cerrone and Mora's individual studios in connection with the Centennial Exhibition of 1876. As many in this audience will know, the centennial in Philadelphia was a pivotal moment in American mass culture. It was attended by nearly a third of the US population during the four months of its opening. And in addition to delivering what Kimberly Orcutt has described as the nation's first blockbuster exhibition of fine art, it also provided millions of viewers with an opportunity for comparative judgment across a global expanse of consumer objects. The scale and magnitude of this display, fueled by an ongoing revolution in industrial manufacturing, effectively destabilized categor categorical distinctions that had traditionally ordered the American material landscape. For example, national borders disappeared as an international assembly of fruits and vegetables were gathered in the agriculture building. Hierarchies of commerce collapsed as ladies' hats, farm equipment, and temple bells all became neighbors in the manufacturing hall and expectations of size and scale were demolished by the giant torch of the Statue of Liberty, the world's largest knife and fork, and a mammoth wheel of Canadian cheese, all of which were on display. Paradoxically, uh, this grand confluence of display proved a significant moment in consolidating a modern identity for photography as a visual system for coping with the unruly material abundance that was visible elsewhere at the fair. 
Since photography's inception in 1839, it had existed rhetorically between standard categories, at a nexus of art and science or imagination and machine. The 20,000 square foot space of the Centennial Photographic Hall presented what was at the time a rare display of media unity. Cerrone's exhibit, which you see here, both in a, his exhibitor's application sketch and captured in a stereograph by Frederick Gutkunst, typified the balance that period photography struck between variety and containment uh, by consolidating a diverse array of photographic portraiture forms within a curtained theatrical frame. And this theme was carried over into the individual photos that Cerrone had on display. Among the cabinet cards and pastel tinted enlargements in the booth was a series of large format staged photographs grandly titled Cerrone's Centennial Tableau. You see those here. Each of the series three images envisioned an episode in the mythic creation of the American flag, relying on material changes in fashion and technology to mark these 100 years of national history. The first image in the series depicted the actress Fanny Davenport playing the part of a colonial dame of 1776. She was dressed as one contemporary observer described it in the fashion of Martha Washington. Davenport appears engaged in hand sewing the American flag in a staged domestic setting that was decorated with a spinning wheel, grandfather clock and examples of 18th century furniture. The second centennial tableau depicts Kate Claxton, another famous actress of the day, this time playing the woman of 1876. Her setting is much the same as the first, except that the colonial dame's spinning wheel has here been replaced by a Wilcox and Gibbs new automatic sewing machine, a domestic convenience that was on display nearby in the Centennial Machinery Hall. This kind of subtle product placement seems at first to align Cerrone's tableau with the numerous Centennial era advertising images that used a before and after motif to compare the quality of life in 1776 with 1876. And these promoted products that ranged from mercantile scales to farm equipment, and but were overwhelmingly united in illustrating how modern industrial innovations represented clear improvements over older ways of doing things. Even the Wilcox and Gibbs company used this type of diametric image in a trade card to market their new automatic sewing machine that's pictured in Cerrone's tableau. Here they presented it to potential consumers as an investment in domestic harmony that was absolutely necessary for the modern home. In Cerrone's three-part tableau, however, it, this standard pattern of before and after was broken um, by presenting a more, in order to present a more ambiguous relationship between the past and present. The final image in his series shows the woman of 1776 working side by side with her modern counterpart. So in this allegorical cycle then, which embodies the span of US history, Cerrone shows the object surrounding human activity as a framework for establishing continuity with the past, a beneficial form of inheritance. In his pictures, the woman of 1776 is no less able to complete her task than the modern woman with her sewing machine, but the job progresses most harmoniously when these embodiments of tradition and technology work together. As such a message took on pointed significance in the context of the Centennial Photographic Hall. And for Cerrone, a photographer who longed for artistic recognition, the message was not simply a sentimental or commercial allegory, though it was this too. Um, it also proposed a strategy through which the photographer of 1876 might imbue his modern industrial medium with a material trace of artistic tradition. With this in mind, it is significant that the period press devoted far more attention to the antique furniture and artifacts that, curated the, that decorated the curated settings of the Centennial Tableau than they did to the celebrity models or modern sewing machine. An explanatory key exhibited alongside the photographs identified these as authentic relics of the revolutionary era, including several objects that had once belonged to President George Washington. The low wooden chair was the one in which Washington was seated during his inauguration. The pedestal table that is mostly obscured by the flag was used in his New Jersey war camp. 
And the pewter tankard and grandfather clock represented artifacts that had survived since Washington's time. And it was noted that these had been lent to the photographer by some of New York's oldest and most distinguished families in order to embellish the historical reality of the depicted scene. And I would note briefly that these insert photos are the actual objects in Cerrone's photo, all of which are now in the collection of the New York Historical Society. Relics of the first US president were of course prominently featured elsewhere at the Centennial. The government hall exhibited a scene of camp life at Valley Forge, complete with Washington's coat, pants, and other mundane personal objects. Carol Ann Marling has noted that these artifacts gestured, quote, toward the special material intimacy with, with the past that the Centennial generation craved, end quote. Embedded in the background of Cerrone's photograph, um, these, historical relative, these historical relics and the material intimacy they conjured bestowed a different form of distinction. Their long traceable histories anchored the fiction that was enacted by the human actors with a solid point of fact, fortifying the industrial technology of photography with this material link to traditional forms of creative production. Michael Leja has described antebellum hybrids of print and photography in terms of what he calls transmedial fortification. And I would propose that a similar alchemy is evident in late 19th century studio tableau. In this case, however, rather than allowing photography to bolster the representational status of other media, Cerrone demonstrates its capacity for omnivorous material consumption, positioning it as the sort of apex predator within period media ecology. The resulting sense of media containment uh, recalls Roland Barthes' description of photography as a transparent envelope that holds the subject matter it displays without disrupting its autonomy. Bart used this phrase in its modernist context to evoke the medium's indexical contingency, a so-called weightless relationship to a depicted referent. But Gilded Age photographers like Cerrone, who were working years earlier and still deeply invested in proving the artistic worth of their young craft, had genuine artistic interest in forcing photography to carry observable weight. Instead of letting subject matter shine through the medium as the thing itself, this earlier mode of photographic envelopment forced the viewer to recognize material distinctions between gradations of thing, human actress, Washington's chair, grandfather clock, as a way of demonstrating photography's power to cast a veil of modernity over a diversity of objects, regardless of their origin point in history. In this way, more than celebrating America's colonial past or advertising the virtues of its present, Cerrone, an ambitious Canadian American from humble beginnings, used photography to claim these things for himself by making them the raw material for elevating his own professional craft. Jose Maria Mora practiced a similar kind of photographic alchemy, although the products of his studio often appear devoted to dematerializing displacing and rearranging conventional realities. The son of wealthy Cuban landowners, Mora's relocation to New York City in 1868 was abrupt and not wholly voluntary. He had been training in Paris as a painter when his family was forced suddenly to flee their home in Havana with the start of the 10 years war. His father and uncles were co-owners of one of the island's largest sugarcane plantations. And as reform-minded members of the Havana elite, they supported the uprising and abolition movement led by Carlos Manuel de Cespedes that launched the island's violent bid for independence from Spanish colonial rule. After resettling in New York, the photographer's father, Jose Maria Sr., joined the local separatist activism movement that was led by Miguel de Aldama and was devoted to bolstering the ongoing revolution in Cuba from afar. The Spanish government had already seized the Mora family's property in Cuba. But in January of 1870, after Jose Maria Sr. helped Aldama draft a manifesto of the Cuban junta that was published in US newspapers, the photographer's father and uncles were sentenced to death in absentia for their complicity in the ongoing rebellion. Previously, the Mora's wealth and privilege had allowed them to travel freely between Manhattan and Havana. But the threat of execution effectively arrested this easy migration by borrowing, barring them from ever returning to Cuba. 
though Morad himself left behind no explicit statements either about his approach to portraiture or his status as a Cuban exile. His career as a photographer took shape against this background, and it is hard not to see a link between the, uh, uh, to see a link between the array of settings his studio became known for and a desire to imaginatively reclaim this mobility and migration. One visitor to Mora's studio in the 1870s noted that the photographer's vast collection of painted backdrops encompassed every style of scenery from Egypt to Siberia and architectural interiors from medieval fortresses to humble cottage kitchens. Mora designed many of these scenes himself in collaboration with the painter Lafayette W. Seavey, who developed a lucrative niche position as the Gilded Age ph photographic industry's main supplier of studio accoutrements. In 1873, advertisement for CV's business boasted a selection of more than 500 artistic backgrounds, all of which could be outfitted with varying classes of props and furniture to construct the perfect setting for any subject. For Cerrone, as we've seen, props were crucial to his imaginative portrait process. And these examples show how just one of CV's backdrops was repeatedly repurposed in Cerrone's studio to suit a variety of dramatic contexts, all through simple changes in staging. That CV's painting virtually disappears within Cerrone's work as it takes on the appearance of a tavern, an attic garret, or the cabin of a ship, highlights once again photography's peculiar position within late 19th century media ecology. It also hints at the complex terms of collaborative networked authorship that characterizes early mass visual culture. Like his peers in photography, C.V. aspired to true artistic recognition, but his ambitions were even more thoroughly frustrated than his peers. In an 1878 article that was published in Scientific American, C.V. beseeched lovers of celebrity photographs to look past the famous faces in order to appreciate the quiet grandeur of backdrop paintings, which he described as, quote, the power behind the throne um, in Cerrone and Mora's successful studios. Some years later, after apparently losing patience with such subtle pleas for attention, C.V. began signing his canvas backdrops in bold dark letters which spoiled their illusionistic effect, but ensured him a greater share of recognition as the power behind the throne. This marvelous portrait of Annie Russell by Mora that's in the collection of the National Portrait Gallery, for example, shows Seavey's large signature in the lower left corner. I share these examples of standard backdrops in use, in part to demonstrate how Mora's lyrical vision for studio photography relied on subtler proofs of artistry. Instead of using his background strictly in the representational sense as they were intended, he rotated and adjusted them to suit his portrait compositions uh, by relying on his judgments of their tonality and abstracted design elements rather than the symbolic points of reference. This portrait of Alice Claypool Vanderbilt, for example, was taken by Mora in conjunction with the 1883 Vanderbilt costume ball. And as some of you may know, it shows the subject dressed as the spirit of electricity in a gown that was made by Worth and contained a hidden battery pack that powered her light up torch. Uh, difficult though it may be, I would echo Lafayette Seavey in directing your attention past this central subject to the background of Morris' photograph and specifically to the way he has positioned it. Once we extinguish Mrs. Vanderbilt's torch, it becomes easier to recognize this as a seascape with a cliff rising out of choppy waters, except that Mora has rotated it out of standard orientation to position it sideways. So the horizon line runs upward along the left-hand margin of the photograph. The same background appears again in Mora's portrait of Lizzie Pelham Bend, who also attended the Vanderbilt ball, um, dressed as a kind of Lady Mephistopheles. Her diabolical character perhaps makes it fitting that Mora this time rotated the seascape backdrop completely upside down, um, so the waterline runs along the upper edge of her portrait. In addition to demonstrating Mora's remarkable creative vision in imagining how these compositional elements could be arranged in the studio and later retouched to suit the characters, the radical repurposing um, of, of backdrops detached this, the paintings from any fixed expectation of spatial familiarity. C.V. may have supplied the paintings to Mora's studio, uh, but Mora deserved his position on the throne. In the context of the artist's studio, 
A seaside cliff could be home to an electric goddess or represent a fiery inferno. In resonance with Mora's own personal experience of migration between places, the space of portraiture became in his studio an infinitely flexible non-site that could be made and remade according to individual expressive need. The fantasy and dislocation that characterizes Mora's society portraits did not mean, however, that he was uninvolved in the real world concerns of the Cuban immigrant community in New York City, especially around the time of the centennial. Among the first independent projects that Mora completed after leaving Cerrone's studio was a grand centennial album, which was described in the Photographic Times of July 1876 as a series of portraits featuring the most prominent young ladies of New York fashionable society. Uh, and it was to be sold by raffle for the benefit of the Ladies Centennial Union. Though this album appears to be no longer extant, it was apparently a sumptuous object. Valued at $3,000, its leather covers were inlaid with sterling silver by Tiffany, and a portrait by Mora was included on each of its thick gold-trimmed pages. The portraits in the, the album contained were by no means conventional likenesses. Each woman pictured was lavishly costumed to represent, quote, one of the 16 nations of the world. Now, the cast list that Mora provided to newspapers included no explanation for this limited number, nor for the criteria that had been used in their selection. But surviving photographs suggest that availability of costumes and possibilities for creative staging may have played a significant role in these determinations. Minnie Stevens, for example, the daughter of the wealthy hotelier Perrin Stevens, represented Egypt in a gold headdress and tightly cinched corset that, ap that appears intended to evoke the mythic allure of Cleopatra. Uh, Stevens had no connection to Egypt, and, but had worn the costume the previous year to great acclaim at a Delmonico's fancy dress ball. And so her casting in the Centennial album was most likely to give her an opportunity to reprise this role. Similarly, a horizontal tableau that grouped ladies costumed as Russia, Lapland, Germ Germany, and Holland was likely motivated as much by Mora creating an opportunity to include a taxidermy polar bear pulling a sleigh in his portrait composition as it had been by considerations of geographic proximity. The original viewers of Mora's centennial album would not have been surprised by these images of ethnic masquerade. Costume balls were popular entertainments of the day, and though options ranged from fairy tale characters to bumblebees, elite party goers often assumed traditional national dress, usually restricting their selections to non racialized rural types from European countries. And indeed, despite, despite the global claims of the Centennial album, the representation of diversity was extremely narrow in scope. Of the roster of 16 nations, nine were European. Minnie Stevens' picture of Egypt was the sole representation of all of Africa. And Mrs. Richard Hunt took on the continent-sized role of Asia, a gesture that offered only the tiniest nod to a vast world of people and cultures that the album purposefully excluded. Coming as it did against a growing wave of global migration to the United States, it is difficult not to see this kind of caricatured appropriation as an act of cultural gatekeeping, with wealthy classes of established Americans presuming to adopt the stereotypical attire of more recent arrivals, as if inherited traditions and ethnic identities were only superficial layers that could be easily slipped on and off. Given these peculiar politics of representation and omission, it is significant that Cuba was prominently included among the 16 nations in Mora's album. In fact, the list the photographer provided to newspapers ranked Cuba fourth among the, Asians of the, among the nations of the world, well before Spain, which he ranked last. More significant still is that the young woman who portrayed Cuba in Mora's photograph was Leonor de Aldama, the youngest daughter of Miguel de Aldama, leader of the US-based Cuban separatist movement to which Mora's family belonged. And I deeply regret that I don't have this photo to show you, um, but I've so far not been able to find it um, despite valiant help from the reference team of the New York Historical Society for which I'm truly grateful. In 1876, with the 10 years war continuing and his family engaged in activism, 
providing Cuba this visibility among the roster of nations and placing the daughter of a separatist leader among the most prominent young ladies of New York fashionable society, subtly naturalized the idea of Cuban independence within a set of photographs that seemed otherwise to be a bit of social theater aimed at defining world relations from an elite white American perspective. Well, this makes Mora's centennial album a more complex and layered political gambit than it may at first appear. Moreover, I think that this demonstrates the complicated historical realities of 19th century national identity that can begin to be reclaimed once we push harder on the fashionable surfaces of Gilded Age portraiture. Unlike the other women in Mora's album who had no personal connection to their national costumes or the sites depicted in their portrait backgrounds, Leonor de Aldama arrived in New York City in 1873 with the condition of exile as a defining feature of her imagined past and future. On this passenger list for her transit, um, both her country of origin and planned citizenship are described solely within these terms, exile. So for her to pose then as Cuba, even within the constructed surround of Mora's studio, was an opportunity to re-inhabit her home country from afar, not in reality, but through an imaginative act of photographic transportation that was in that moment the only available alternative. Considering the tacit political aims of Mora's album, it is an ironic point of connection with Cerrone's tableau that the funds earned from its sale were used by the Ladies Centennial Association to support the decorative renovation of George Washington's mansion at Mount Vernon and specifically were invested in refurbishing the Grand State Dining Room that between 1884 and 1894 was known as the New York Room and used for the display of relics from the first president's life, artwork, furniture, and artifacts similar to those that had been featured in Cerrone's, in Cerrone's photographs. For both Cerrone and Mora then, the multimedia engagement and staging of a so-called elaborate style was not so much a reflection of economic abundance as a material renegotiation of the expressive possibilities of photography. Far from lacking connection to real world cultural and political concerns, we see in the ephemeral constructed spaces and deployment of significant objects, an aspirational vision aimed at permanently altering the backdrop of American history. By examining these migrant surrounds, the spaces and things that frame the central human subjects, we gain a richer sense of how late 19th century portraiture participated in the process of framing personal, professional, and national identity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erin, and thank you for this great talk. And it's been so great to see these photographs um, on the screen, and thank you for uh, sharing your work with us. So uh, we do have some questions coming in. So I wanted to remind everyone attending to please uh, drop in your questions in the Q&A, which should be on the right side of your um, bottom ribbon on the screen. Uh, so please drop in your questions there. And I'm sure that we have many coming in already. So I just wanted to start off with actually one question that I had um, and that would be great for everyone to um, sort of to hear more about it is really, what is the, can you explain more what the migrant surround is um, and sort of expand on that some more in terms of the conversation? Uh, yeah, thank you, Leslie, happy to. Um, it's, it's an idea I'm really thinking through um, in trying to imagine how, how portrait photography and portrait studios work, um, and particularly to try to find some, um, more empathetic explanation for why this kind of theatricality exists in photographic portraiture to imagine that it had some real cultural function rather than just being bad taste or um, you know, a poor use of a photographic language. So, um, so for me, it, it refers to this kind of use of a photographic studio space as being something that's fundamentally transformable. And I've been trying to think, look through um, sort of how specific photographers used it to, to think about the ways that it was used to refashion um, identity. So this kind of ephemeral space, its theatricality and its ease of construction, um, then also kind of has this um, possibility of transforming the, the identity of the subjects pictured within it. 
Thank you. And as a follow up to the same, thank you, Karen, for this question. It was why migrant? Why does it, is it this migrant? Or why does it does it need the word migrant in the description? Um, well, in that, I'm working with T.J. Damos's book, um, and he's thinking about these images of sort of displacement and dislocation in terms of their creativity and the kind of opportunity that's presented in blurring reality and fiction for creating something new. Um, the, the way that something that's parafictional kind of intrudes upon the real world. So it's, it's a reference to that idea um, in his work that then seems to have connections to the late 19th century as well. Thank you. Um, thanks, Karen, for that question. And, uh, we have a question about the backgrounds and sort of who painted the backdrops. You've already mentioned um, CV, but were there others who were involved and how, who were they, how did they work with the studio? Um, we have one relationship and a signature that obviously disrupts the image um, right. and, and punctures that um, idea of that space. Yeah, poor poor CV. Um, he's the only he's the only one that I've sort of reliably been able to identify. In part because he worked so hard in making himself known. Um, we, there is that signature, but he also would mention in his advertisements which photographs his backgrounds appeared in, um, which is how I know those that set of Cerrone photographs that that that's a CV backdrop because CV mentions the Joseph Jefferson portrait of Rip Van Winkle. Um, Cerrone also painted a lot of his own backdrops, which he kind of characteristically signed prominently as well, because um, he was always sort of finding ways to also promote himself. Um, my understanding is that Mora may have designed some of the backdrops. He was trained as a painter, um, and the work that he did for Cerrone's studio was um, tinting and coloring and um, embellishing enlarged photographs. So his, his photographic practice he claimed later hadn't really come from Cerrone because he had worked as a painter for Cerrone. Mm -hmm. um, all of that is to say that um, it seems as if he either sent designs to CV for them to be executed. It's possible that he may have painted those himself, but I haven't found evidence of that. Um, and I don't, and as far as it goes na nationwide, I'm, I'm positive there were other scenic painters working, um, but maybe who didn't have the same kind of notoriety as CV, so just harder to locate. Maybe they can put their signatures. <laughs> yeah, they should, have, should have done that. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we would know. Um, there are few more. Wow. Thank you, everyone, for putting in questions. I, I looked at all of us again. I looked at the Q&A, and there were so many more. So wonderful. So a question from John Ott. Thank you, John, for your question. Um, many scholars have identified strong currents of xenophobia and assimilated discourse in many iterations of the colonial revival. In light of Cerrone's migrant identity, to what extent do his practices endorse, revise, critique, or upend its prevailing nativism? I think it complicates it. I don't think any either, I don't want to present either of these photographs as being an antidote to, you know, what Archer and Apadurai is called the colonial background. I, I think that we see that in operation. And hi, John, by the way. Um, so I, I, I think that these photographs are operating in dialogue with that. Um, my, my hope is, though, to make it a more complicated conversation by thinking about where the photographers themselves were coming from or imagining what it would have meant for them to use these types of photographic devices as um, what Apadre has called experiments in, mo in modernity. Um, you know, so if the backdrop becomes this ground for trying something new, for representing a modern type, or for, in some cases, you know, fixing someone's identity into stereotype. There are ways that we might see that too as breaking apart conventions and challenging the representational systems of photography. Um, so if we think, if we can not think about photographs as just document or not think about these as just theater, I think there are more interesting ways that we can approach them um, and messier histories that we can tease out of these sort of arrangements of, of background and subject. And there's a question specific to um, from Robert Rice. Any comment on what seems to be the inclusion of two images of Native American Indians in the images where the colonial woman is making the flag? Yes, um, a good eye, by the way. Um, that, that's an interesting, it's a piece of furniture that is in a lot of Cerrone Studio um, photographs, but it, in, that, in those images, it has two painted panels apparently affixed to the front that are taken derived from the state seal of Virginia. 
Um, so that that's what they are. I, I believe they were painted by Cerrone. They kind of look like his his style. Um, but it's one of the newspaper descriptions where that details all of the things in the backgrounds, not happening in the actual performance, but talks about this that being kind of a reference to Washington's heritage. Okay. And I guess not necessarily I have a few questions here about the making of these albums. And one of them is from Warren Walters about were these done on commission? And then I have a question about how did people, re I mean, I know that there was the $3,000 super expensive fine one that we can't find right. in its entirety, but in terms of how did people um, speak about, um, how did people, contemporaneous you know, buyers react to these? Um, you know, what I was struck by the sewing machine scene um, was, you know, this combination of these, you know, this collapse of the history and bringing them together um, in 1876 with the sewing machine and the, and the flag. But how did people catch on to that? Like, what was it that people really, um, yeah, did people comment on what was happening in these scenes and in writings or reviews or whatnot? And then also, you know, who bought these? Good, good questions all. Um, and in some cases, I don't have perfect answers. Um, and, and for both Cerrone and Mora, it's kind of been, uh, the research process has been a matter of piecing together little scraps. Um, I, I conclude from the fact that not very many of the centennial tableaus by Cerrone have survived, that those were not big sellers. Um, you know, and I, then I don't know what we can make then of the success of his professional elevation or as, as a gambit. Um, but, but I think I, I found them in the Library of Congress and they're, they're talked a lot about in the press, but I've not seen too many other copies of them except as cabinet cards, which were much smaller. But those were intended to be parlor decorations. And so some contemporary newspapers um, talk about them in terms of popular prints. Um, and Cerrone's background before he became a photographer was he, he ran a, first he worked for Nathaniel Courier and then he ran his own lithographic firm so my speculation is that he had hoped that this would be sort of splitting the difference um, in, as a formal and commercial application between photography and popular prints. And I'm not, I don't think it took off. Um, it's in, they're in a large matted um, frame and that, that has poetry written on the bottom, which I didn't include in the presentation. Um, as, as for the album, uh, I, I believe it, it was commissioned by the Lady Centennial Association. Um, Mora's brother had was close friends with uh, the owner of Delmonico's restaurant, which is which was a popular site for a lot of costume balls prior to the centennial. They had one every year, and it was the society event of the season. Um, so I think I think, and again, this is me guessing um, based on little scraps that. Uh, Jose Maria Mora was was hooked up with the Delmonico's ball because uh, he has a lot of these costume ball photographs, and that that was how he got the commission from the Ladies Centennial uh, Association to make to make the album that was then auctioned off. Um, but I think the it's a, it's an interesting question too, since you know a lot of the portraits that Cerrone and Mora made were of actresses and celebrities and public figures, um, but the women depicted in the Centennial album by Mora were um, private citizens, so to speak. Um, so having their photographs be um, kind of wide scale commercial sale would have been thought of as inappropriate, but the sort of the fact of it being for charity and in a raffle setting um, and to benefit um, the, the ladies association sort of allowed them to participate in public image making and to let their images be circulated in a commercial setting that wouldn't normally have been thought appropriate. So the fact that that was a one-off um, album has, is what has made it hard for me to find. I, th I think it must've been disassembled, um, but, but it also means that it went to one owner and sort of had a limited audience after the point of its sale that was discussed in the press. And then do we know, how, I mean, Aldama, I mean, there's a relationship already, um, possible relationship already at least established through, um, being both of them cute from Cuba, but do we know how, the, how he came, how Mora came to know the other women who were part of this? Were they just, were they, did they come and sit for him? Like, was it the Centennial Association? Is there, or is that also missing? 
I'm afraid I don't know the yeah. answer to that. I, you know, again, it's, and, and, yes. and Mora is, is such a tantalizing character because he has an amazing personal story and his work is so beautiful. Um, but he never said anything about mm-hmm. it. He was very adamant um, in believing that he shouldn't, he shouldn't advertise, um, he sh- you know, sh- shouldn't participate in fairs, shouldn't do these, but he, he, uh, con- and consequently, he, there's very little, um, voice from him that's actually been recorded. So I'm trying to find a way to tell his story anyway, but it is, um, but sadly then I have questions, but I share that question and I just don't know the answer. Thank you. Um, so another, I'm going through the questions. So uh, from David Shields, uh, Cerrone, Mora, Great. Kurtz, and Moreno were all draftsmen painters, all engaged in retouching, but to what extent are they painting the glass negative plates? It looks like Mora's backgrounds have backdrop and painted portions. And have you seen anything where the background is entirely painted on the glass negative, like Strauss Payton and Alfred Cheney Johnston after 1900? Great, great questions. And I'm thrilled um, to have you here, David. Um, uh, yes, I think Mora's, Mora's photographs in particular show evidence of painting. Um, and the, the two portraits where I removed the ladies, um, I think that you can really see at that point how the the painting that's in the background that has been photographed um, works in concert with painting that has been done on the surface of the glass negative. Um, and I know that a lot of the photographers that you mention are, they prided themselves on having a multifaceted set of artistic skills. Um, so being their, their background in traditional arts was often used to justify their claims to artistic identity as photographers. Um, and, and Cerrone painted and used lithography significantly in his work, um, often in the print after they were printed um, Mora is more, um, at least, and again, this is not, this is based on observation rather than um, them talking about their process or um, having these negatives, all of which seem to not, not, no longer be extant. Um, but, but Cerrone or Mora seemed more invested in painting um, imaginatively on the surface of the photograph. The, the portrait of uh, Maud Branscombe as Ophelia is one of the most overpainted that I have found. Um, but there are some other uh, portraits of women who are, again, from costume balls and are meant to represent the night sky or um, you know, be sort of in a snowstorm. And those, those by Moore are also very heavily painted so that it almost you can't see where the photograph begins and ends. Um, Benjamin Falk also did a lot of overpainting, um, but sort of in a more theatrical kind of a sense. I hope that answered your question. Did answer David's question? I can't see. <laughs> I can't see him, but I'm gonna say yes. Um, so one question: There are a few people who are asking about you. Just used the word theater, theater, um, and theatrical, and um, talking about uh, these backdrops, whether or not they were used. Um, whether the artists who were make, making these backdrops were also working in theater. And then also a question of whether the people, um, say they, if the people in the photographs get to choose the background and the setting that they were setting, or is that, you know, what was the negotiation between photographer and, and, and sitter? That's a, another, another great question. Um, it, Cerrone was known to be very authoritative in his studio. I, I think he chose backdrops, but I know that he also, um, when working with actresses like um, Sarah Bernhardt, they, they called the shots a lot of the time about how they wanted to be represented. So I think it depended on who the sitter mm-hmm. was. Um, I I've f- found a lot of um, vernacular photographs that echo these celebrity ones. It's more common to see um, photographs from Cerrone or Mora's studio that are well-known people just because more copies of those were printed. But they both made family photos as well that used these same kinds of theatrical staging for non-performer subjects. Um, I have a little boy at the beach or something like that. So, I, and I would guess in that case, there is some sense, some negotiation in just the way that in modern portrait studios, this happens too. Um, you know, families get to choose or people have some amount of say. Uh, but my guess is that that varies a lot. Um, as far as the theater question goes, um, for the most part, these, a lot of these uh, 
photographs appear as if they are stage shots or things derived directly from the theater, but they are always um, scenes that are staged in photographic studios rather than photographs that are taken on stage in theaters. Um, B.J. Falk was one of the first people to take photographs indoors in a theater, but he had to use an elaborate chemical lighting system, and they look it, it looks really shockingly drawn into relief. Um, so the more controlled lighting conditions that were available to photographers in their studios were more appealing. Um, so they often actors would reenact, or then the photographers would stage a kind of interpretation of a popular drama or melodrama, but in the context of the photographic studio and using set pieces that were designed to fit that space rather than the space of a full-scale theater. Thank you. And I'm afraid this will be the last question. I apologize to all the other questions. People, we have a lot of questions, but I, I hope that um, we will try to get back to you as much as we can. But um, this is from Mariola Alvarez. And given your interest in how these photographs begin to form a place and an identity called America slash United States, could you place them in relation to the history of portrait painting at the time in, at this time in the US? Do they differ or share any similarities with portrait painting in the 1870s and 80s? And how portrait painting has been defined as American. Oh, thank you, thank you, Mariola. I think that's a great question. Um, and I, I see a lot of overlap between the photographic work of Cerrone and Mora and the sort of resurgence of a grand manner of society painting um, by, by US artists, um, such as uh, William Merritt Chase or John Singer Sargent. And to the point where Chase and Cerrone, who were close friends, used a lot of the same tropes and shared subjects at certain times. Um, so, so there's definitely a conversation that in sometimes is, um, you know, the photographer pulling on the sort of representational strings established by painting and other times vice versa, I think. Um, so it's part of a larger set of conversations around um, kind of intermediality during the late 19th century. To the point about, um, American identity and portraiture. Um, I, I think there's a larger sense in which this shows how portraits are participating in public life in a different way, particularly in the late 19th century. Um, so photography could be a little more easily mobilized since it was reproducible, but um, there are a lot of paintings that are showing um, the kind of public sense of self or that are imbued with this theatricality that I, I think relates to the growing celebrity culture and a des increasing desire of private citizens to figure out how to um, be public selves and using theater as a model for that, um, but also as a, as a way of sort of um, shaping a larger set of identities on, on a world stage too. So kind of using, using art and self-making in concert with one another as models. Thank you so much. Thank you, Erin, it was great. And oh, thank, you. Um, thank you everyone for all of your questions. And Kate, take it away. <laughs> I just wanna thank both of you, Leslie and Erin, and to all of our attendees. Um, there were so many different layers in your lecture, Erin, that I'm, you know, that we can all think about and sort of um, deconstruct and unravel. I think <laughs> I'm fascinated by the Cuba tangents um, and connections that you were making just because that's where my mind is at the moment. Um, right. <laughs> so I can't thank you enough. And I just want to let everyone know that we are going to be talking with Hélène Quincrin, who is French, and Kirsten Pye Buick, um, who is in New Mexico, <laughs> um, next month on February 8th. And we'll be talking about Wendell Phillips and Edmonia Lewis. So please join us on February 8th at 5. Um, and until then, thanks again for everyone's uh, attention. And Aaron will get um, a copy of the transcript. Script. So if there are any questions that were not answered, like Sarah, I had had a question and a few other people, um, yeah, we can reach out to you afterwards. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.